Michael Dunn es un ejecutivo líder con experiencia especial en el futuro de China, vehículos eléctricos y autónomos. De 1990 al año 2016, Michael Dunn experimentó de primera mano el crecimiento asombroso de las industrias automotrices asiáticas como fundador de su propia compañía. Dunn revela cómo las ambiciones globales de China están desencadenando una conmoción en la industria de la tecnología automotriz de rápido cambio en el mundo. Démosle un fuerte aplauso a Michael Dunn de Dunn Automotive. Mr. Kazima, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and bring a message from across the Pacific, from China. Now, uh, this is my first trip to Latin America, first trip to Panama, so I want to try some local language. Hola, en que sopa. Yeah. I understand we have people from over 30 countries here today, so I want to get to know you guys a little bit better by asking three questions right away. I want to see a show of hands, please. First question, how many of us have driven an electric car? Oh, quite a number, about a quarter, about 25%. How many of us have ridden in an autonomous vehicle? Okay, not so many people, but some, yeah? All right, third question. How many of us, when I say China, think of a high quality premium electric car like a Tesla? Yeah, not, not too many, all right? Well, my major message today to you is that within five years, all of us here will be driving electric cars, will be riding in autonomous cars, and most of those cars are gonna be supplied by what country? China. China. Do you believe that? Is that? Could that be true? Wait a second, isn't China the place with the Great Wall and the Panda, maybe some dim sum? Really, can they build a Tesla? You bet they can, and I'm gonna show you how they intend to do it. Now, come with me first of all though, in order to understand the China of the future, we have to step back in time and look at the China of the past. And I want to show you three frames here. Do the faces look familiar? There's Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao. Then there's Deng Xiaoping. And currently we have a guy named Xi Jinping. His last name is Xi. He is Xi. You with me? All right. Mao comes to power in 1949. And he says to the Chinese people, from today, he's standing in front of the Forbidden City on a pedestal. He announces to hundreds of thousands of Chinese, from today, we stand up. We stand up, no more colonial domination, no more Japanese invasion, no more civil war. We Chinese can stand on our own. And he succeeded in uniting the country, but for the next 30 or 40 years, he put his people through all kinds of trauma, chaos, the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, 100 Flowers Campaign, so that at the end of his era, the Chinese people had stood up, but they were tired and they were poor, all right? How poor, let me tell you, when I went to China for the first time in the 1980s, there were no high-rise buildings, there were no cars, there was no makeup, no nice clothes. China was a poor country. I earned, my first year in China, $90 a month. That was my salary. And my employer said, you should count yourself very lucky. Only Chairman Mao made that much money in a month. You're rich. And the fact was that even though I had only $90, at the end of every month, I couldn't spend it out. There was nothing to buy. Nothing. All right? So China's poor and tired. Here comes Deng Xiaoping, 1980. Little guy, pragmatic guy, hands-on says, forget about revolution. Forget about ideology. I want to let the Chinese people make some money. He traveled to Japan and the United States, and what he saw there was that, hey, rich countries have strong auto industries. We want that. We want to have a strong auto industry, and the way we're going to do it is we're going to invite the global automakers to come in to China, partner with us in joint ventures, and over time, we Chinese are clever, we're going to be able to make cars ourselves. That was his big idea. And as all of us know today, China under Deng Xiaoping did in fact get a lot richer. It went from poverty to the second, arguably the first largest economy in the world. 
More cars made in China today by far than the United States. So Deng accomplished his mission, mission of getting people, getting China richer. Now what? What do we do now? This guy Xi Jinping comes along and says, we're standing up, we're rich, what's next? Let's get powerful. Let's get powerful. In fact, he has a, a term for it. He said, and the translation is, we Chinese now, it's time for us to get powerful. That's an official slogan that every Chinese person knows. Well, how are they going to get powerful? How does a country get, go from rich to being powerful? It means leadership. And he has a plan. It's called Made in China 2025. Very ambitious plan. China says that by 2025, they will be number one in AI, number one in autonomous, number one in electric vehicles, number one in manufacturing and robotics. So some people ask me, oh, get more powerful. It's nice to have a slogan, made in China 2025. Really, are they serious? Yes, they are. In fact, we can take a look at some of the early results. You see this car? It's called a Byton. It will go into production next year. It's very much like the Tesla Model X. I've ridden in it, a prototype, earlier this year at CES. The company is led by two German executives from BMW who led their electric car program. It has offices in Silicon Valley, in Munich, and in Shanghai. It's owned and funded by Chinese investors. Here's another example. KUKA Robotics, arguably the most advanced robotics company in the world, German originally, now is owned by a Chinese company called Mindia. Bought it in 2016 for $5 billion. So the Chinese have electric cars like the Tesla, they have robotics companies, and guess what else? Last month, no, earlier this month, Baidu, the Google of China, introduced this level four vehicle that will appear on the streets of China and Japan by the end of the year, level four. This is not the China of cheap auto parts and cheap products and toys and dip sum. No, this is the real deal. This is why the United States is so concerned. China is presenting a direct challenge to our leadership globally. Now, if you're with me so far and starting to believe this story, you think, okay, good. Wh which Chinese companies can I get close to? Who can I supply? Who can I repair? Uh, I was trying to capture the Chinese automotive players in one slide, and, and this is a pretty good illustration. There's too many Chinese car companies out there. There's hundreds of Chinese companies. So what we're going to try to do is slim it down and put them in categories so you get an idea of who's who. Don't worry about the names. I was talking to my father as I was preparing this presentation. And he said, Chinese names, Beijing, Chicha, Chili, Biyadi. These are too difficult to remember. Don't worry about the specific names. We're just talking concept today. You can copy my slides later. You get to memorize the names at home. All right. First thing to understand, China makes one third of vehicles globally. One third. One of every three vehicles built this year, 90 million, will be built in China. There are, is there a Detroit of China? No. There's many, many centers of automotive production scattered all over the country. So if you think, can I go to China and go to one city and find all the cars? No. You got to tour the country. Who are the leaders? Now, the best way to understand who the leading car companies are, come with me a little bit here. I know it's a little detailed and complex, but if it's not complex, it's not China. That's the reality. On the far left, you will see six companies. They're known as the big six. These are massive state enterprises owned by the national government that account for about 75% of total production in the industry. Shanghai Auto, Beijing Auto, First Auto Works, Dongfang, Guangzhou, Chang'an. They've been around for a long time, they'll be around for a long time. Together they, together they make something like 20 million vehicles a year. All right, the one thing they don't do well is innovate. And the government said, these state enterprises are big, they produce a lot of cars, but where's the innovation? We need people thinking and innovating and creating. 
So into the picture comes the next column. G. Lee, BID, BYD, and Great Wall. These are private companies that have the blessing of the provincial government and they, they're actually the fastest growing in the industry. But like the state enterprises, they're not the best at innovating. So just in the last few years, the government said, in order for us to innovate and lead, we need to be great in electric vehicles. We want new players to come into the industry. And they have. Look at the names. Neo, Byton, Lead Motors, WM Motors, Xiao Peng Motors, Karma. All of these companies have been formed in the last three years. And they're backed by billions of dollars of new funding. If you haven't heard their names, it's okay. They're so new. All right? Then the fourth layer of the auto industry are what I call alternative. These are the tech companies, the Googles and the Apples, now entering the automotive industry too. They're backing many of the new electric vehicle players. Okay, are you guys still with me? Yes. There's a lot of car companies. Try to sort it out, state enterprise, privates, electrics, and then tech companies coming in. It's a big mess, but over time a lot of them will fall out and you'll be able to pick the winners. All right, just a side note. I mentioned early on that Deng Xiaoping said, the way for us to lead is to learn from the foreigners, form joint ventures. So if you look at the big six across the top, those are your state enterprises. They're married with global automakers, but the relationship has been, in the words, in the mind of Chinese people, an epic fail. Why? Because China has always been catching up with the technology of the global automakers, never equaling or surpassing. And that's been frustrating for China. We don't want to follow, we want to lead. How can they lead? They want to lead in electrics. They haven't been able to learn to lead from partnerships with the globals. What can they do? Anybody have any ideas? Copy. Copy is a good idea. Copy, they, you know, they say in China, R&D is short for receive and duplicate. Okay. Yeah, uh, but copying still brings them close to leaders, but doesn't put them in front. Research. Research. Where are they going to do research? Research at home? What? Where are they going to see? Buyouts. Buyouts. Act very good. Yes, acquisitions. Uh, part acquisitions. Part research. Exactly right. Where are they doing this? Mostly? California. My goodness, my home now is in California. I drive up and down the coast of Silicon Valley. There are dozens of Chinese companies there. Incredible. Backed by billions of dollars. Doing first rate R&D and acquisition so they can learn the very best. They're hiring from Tesla, from Google, from Apple. They're taking that technology and putting it where? China. Back home, where their market is where the Made in China 2025 goals are, okay? You guys see where this is going, right? Do you think the United States is happy about this? Uh, not so happy. We would be happier if China was an open market, but is China an open market? And no, it's not in their DNA. As I say to my friends, if the door in the back is halfway open, Americans will go, and actually, well, let's open it all the way. In China, if the door is halfway open, what do they do? Close that baby. Quickly. Before someone gets in or someone gets out. It's that deep in their culture. All right. So with this research and development and acquisitions, guess what? China today has more than 49 electric vehicle makers. May I ask in the front row, before you came in, how many electric vehicle makers do you think China had before you came in the room today? One, two, three, anybody? Six, maybe? They have 49 and counting. All right, they could be grouped into two. Oh, sorry. This is give you an idea, the print is too small, but the idea, these are the best selling electric cars in China. The point here is that there's so many of them, that none of them make in big volume. These are sales last year. The number one best-selling model last year, EV model, sold 76,000 cars in China. If you look all the way to the right, you'll see 465,000. Most cars 
built in China had volumes of EVs, sorry, had volumes of less than 15,000. So highly scattered, low volume, too many players, okay? Do they make only expensive electric cars? No, they make the full gamut. You can buy a, an electric car, the Giorno D2, for $7,500. It's one of the best sellers. On the other end of the spectrum, you can buy a Tesla lookalike. In fact, they're on Chinese roads today. This is the NEO ES8. NEO is backed by Tencent, which is the Facebook of China. Valued the same as Facebook, even more now. They have some powerful financial backers and a very good looking car. In San Jose, California, NEO has an R&D office that I've been to many times. 500 software engineers. Whoa, 500 software engineers in Silicon Valley doing state-of-the-art work is going to produce a quality vehicle. Is there anything in between? Yes. Uh, the two leaders to watch in the EV space, one is Beijing Auto and the other one is BYD. BYD, of course, is invested by Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. They're, they're a likely winner. In fact, BYD just last month sold 100 electric buses to Chile, the government of Chile. They're coming into Latin America. I'm sorry, I believe BYD is also manufacturing batteries, their own batteries, right? Oh yes, one of the biggest battery manufacturers in the world. They started their business uh, by, by manufacturing batteries for cell phones and now they've traded up to, to, to cars. Now, that's not the only kind of EV they make. This too is a Chinese product. It's called the EP9. It's built by NEO. Its price is $1.2 million. It's the second fastest electric car in the world right now. Byton says it beat it by a split second, but I mean, 3.2 seconds and 3.2.1 seconds. <laughs> okay, fast, very fast. All right, so let's take a breath. That's the picture. How does China manage to be so powerful? If you ask me, it comes back to, they know how to leverage a massive home market. China's market by 2025 will be 35 million a year. And if you see along the bottom, last year 97% of cars built and sold in China were built in China. They have a huge home market that they protect really, really well. Once they have that home market as a base and they're profitable at home, guess what? They're gonna go global. It's happening within the next five years. You can bank on it. In fact, this strategy is not a new one. If you remember, China had a civil war during the 1940s, and Mao Zedong had this famous saying. It said, uh, It means take the countryside and surround the cities. In other words, accumulate a lot of mass strength and you can squeeze out the smaller markets. Well, guess what? With China being such a massive home market, they now have set their targets on Europe, the United States, and other markets around the world. Which, which brings me back to the fish. Now, when I first met Mr. Gaslima a year ago, I told him the story of meeting the founders of Sequoia Capital, a venture capital company in Silicon Valley. And I asked the founder, how did Sequoia become the most powerful venture capital company in the world. How did you become a billionaire? And he said, it's easy. All we do here is look for the next wave. And when that wave is coming, we ride it. And he said, the next wave coming is electric and autonomous vehicles. So it's time for all of us to get out our fishing pole, put the line in the water, and get ready to catch one of these fish that are coming our way. We're bound to get a big one. Thank you.